All right, everyone. So my name is Aaron Kelly, and today we're going to be talking about a project that I hold really dearly. This project is in my local area, and it's the protecting area, what is just up the street from me. So a bit about myself. Um, since I was out of the womb, I was lifting up logs, looking for insects and bugs. I've always been mad about nature ever since I was a kid. And I was, it was always brought on to me by my family too. I would always got brought out fishing. What I always got learned how to look after nature around me. And I was lucky because I grew up in an area that had nature close to me. Um, ever since I was young, I used to keep a lot of reptiles, snakes. I used to be crazy. People would have came all around where I lived just to see the animals. And when I got a wee bit older, I started going up and I was lucky to have a space close to where I lived, um, which was the Black Mountain. Currently, um, I'm a nature reserve assistant with the Ulster Wildlife, which is like a dream job for me. And on the side, um, I would be doing a bit of bird ringing up a mall and glass at the yard. And I'll also be um, helping with the Black Mountain Rewilding Project in my own area. So if you have never seen the Black Mountain before, this is it here on the left. The Black Mountain is a massive expanse of hill, which you will see. And it's just nestled in between Sleeve and the Cloy and lag between Lag and Dam. It's a beautiful, if you ever look along the bottom here, you'll see it's just got open fields along the whole bottom. And it's joined by a nice, lovely woodland, it's a bit of, bit of scrub, and it goes up to some woodland. And on top, you've got nice grass under, there, and it, it connects on the divots. So I have loads of memories here growing up when I was a kid. It was, um, you know, the area I grew up in, sometimes it was a wee bit mad. So I think this is my wee place to go on a skateboard. And growing up, because I was already keen in nature, I was able to develop my skills of ID and develop my skills and love for nature up here because I got to see it firsthand. And also got to see it changing since I was a kid. It's you, there's a lot of natural regeneration what's happened in the area. One of my best memories is going up and used to be able to swing on a sycamore tree up here, and there's a picture of it there. And we would have swung, we would have just swung off out all day long in the summer. Um, there's loads of features to the area. So along the top, you've got heath and bog, big open fields of coarse grass, um, beautiful way of flower meadows in the summer. It's surrounded by a lot of quarries. If you look at the mountain, there's about three or four um, quarries on it. Uh, you've got lovely remnants of ancient hazel woodland and, and some of the gullies. So there's about two or three gullies on this mountain. And this is where, at one point, most of the trees were cut down on the mountain. But in the gullies, this is where the, the trees were left to kind of they kind of still grow. Some it's very young, but as you go up into the higher hills a lot of it's ancient and there's some really old hazel trees and actually some of my best habitat which is scrub i love scrub it's the best for the birdies and so if you're every, every walking free in the summer the amount of um well warblers sage warblers there's so much um uh, migrants we get in here in the summer and if you ever walk through the wee areas like this it's just haven with loads of birds another feature of the mountain is the hatchet field so if you ever look up in the black mountain you'll see for some reason there's a shape of a, the, the, the lands in the shape of a hatchet and there used to be a wee house up here and funny enough the people up here were actually murdered by a hatchet a man with a hatchet so we don't know if the feeds like this because of that or because one second There you go, I was just the dogs. So the field, when you look up, is in the shape of a hatchet, and there was actually people murdered on this field by a hatchet. So if you're not really, for the average person who thinks about the Black Mountain, this is what they'll think about. It's the iconic hatchet field. And when you go up, you can actually still see the remnants of the old houses and farmhouses that used to be up there. Um, growing up, there's a lot of frats in the area. Uh, one of the biggest threats was that there, it was a lot of land was sold for being quarrying. So as far as I can remember, it's always been under threat. Um, this quarry here that took massive amounts of the land, huge amounts, and and uh, it was actually used as a top. It was actually going to be used as a toxic waste dump as well, which was stopped by this man here. So when I think of activism and when I think of how one man can make a difference, 
and especially in the owner eight, this man here is one person who really did make a difference for being for just being one person. He he done a lot. He done a lot for the area. So during the times of the quarrying, um, he would have gathered massive protests to to go against it. He would have he would have started leading people up and using it as a resource for education and a resource for just to keep your head sweet. You know, growing up in the troubles, I said would have been a bit mad out down below, and this would have been some place where you could go and get away from that and listen to the birds or, you know, what I mean, chill in the grass and have a, have a nice time. And because of this man here, it actually prohibited the growth of the quarry. You call him Terry Enright. And I have actually a lot of memories of him bringing me up the mountain when I was younger and showing me all the plants and showing me all the, the, the plants you can eat and all the different, the kestrels and the skylarks. And really, and when he passed away, it's kind of just whatever ha happened, that's just, it kind of just, what he was doing, it kind of died with him, which is sad. And if it wasn't for him, you wouldn't have the National Trust Devis Mountain Walk. So he helped actually protect that bit of land there and get that set up. When I and then as the years went on, there's still threats. It may not have been as big, but there's always still your threats. You've got development. And one time during lockdown, I went up and I seen the place as trice to a litter. So I started to think, how can we go and actually do something about this and make a wee change to the area and bring it back to being its natural self? And so I used social media and got a lot of people on board. And there's actually, there's more threats there. So there's some of the fires in the summer. That's a huge amount of land. And when that fire, come, when that fire goes, all comes back as bracken. I've also found uh, pigeons from pigeon men, poison bait for taking out the paragons and the kestrels. And the sad thing about this is this pigeon would also take out terrestrial mammals. Maybe fox gets out the fox go there. So we started off with a cleanse and uh, we, we got a good squad up and we started cleaning the mountain. And we had the whole mountain spotless in a matter of four, four three weeks. And it's just transformed the place. But this kind of sparked my way of thinking as if I could get these people just to go up and do this cleaning it only takes one day a week I wonder I wonder what you can do if you put more effort into what you're trying to more effort into the place so I got when I was out what the, on the last clean I seen uh the scat of a pain martin you can see it to the left here so this is a pain martin scat it's not really a good image but when I seen that Alarm bells started going off my head. I started thinking there's a way to protect us because at the time there's trying to put a path going through this mountain to connect the divas. So I was thinking, I wonder what ways there is to try to try to stop this and bingo, the pain martin, the savior of the mountain. So I started uh, searching up about pain martins heavily and I started to work out even just the wee prints and how to go about finding them using trail cameras. And this really got me on the hunt to survey and what's actually on this mountain. Because growing up, I knew what, I knew what it had, but I didn't know the depth of the actual species it had and how much of an asset and priority piece of habitat it is. So, so going and using the trail cameras, I got some selfies like this. So trail cameras usually do you dirty. There's a picture of me with no eyebrows. And then there's a picture of a badger, we badger selfies. So the trail cameras were good crack. And I went off and I remember getting these free animals. And this is like the first time I used a trail camera and it blew my mind. I was like, Jesus Christ, there's a fox up there. Never made, you know, they never made anything else. You've just seen a fox. And then this pheasant, this is the, the wandering pheasant. And it was just walking around the mountain for about two months, just looking at mate. Me and my mate now, we were talking about it. And we felt really sorry for it because it just didn't have no luck. And seeing the badgers, this is the first ever picture of a badger on the mountain too. So even though people can look up in the area, if you're interested in wildlife, you can kind of look up in an area and say, yes, it has badgers. But to the regular person, they don't know what. So... What I'm trying, what I was trying to do was to look for all these rare animals so I could show people how important this place is. Because growing up, we were, we all just thought there was nothing on it. Well, most people would have thought there was nothing on it. So then the day came when we found the pain martin. This was the first ever uh, picture of a pain martin back on the Belfast Hills, and this is is a bingo. So as soon as we got this, we realised that. Now, now is the time to start pushing to help protect this mountain and get the work done on it. So seeing the pain, Martin, it started to spark my interest. If it's on the pain, Martin, it's obviously holding stuff up there. What we don't know is, what we don't know is up there. So we went on, the, on another hunt and to see what birds and what mammals, even insects, because, you know, there's some insects up there that are really rare. And the more we can jot down what is on this hill, the better protected it could be. So... We wanted to aid in the pain martins. So what we done was 
me and my dad, we made a few pain marm boxes. Here they are here. So this is a breeding box. Uh, the woodland I showed you on the mountain, it's very um, immature. And the trees needed for them to breed in, we don't have them. So they need wee holes to breed, crevices. Um, there's some areas in the, in the mountain what would suit them, but we want to give them options. When it comes to wildlife, any of our species, you want to give them options. You know, you don't want to have them forced to, to breed somewhere that they don't want to. So we, we want to give them places to breed in areas that are really quiet and secluded for them. So if you can look at the pay martin box here, there's uh, three chambers to it. So there's two wee holes in the back where the pay martin come in. And then it, it has this nesting chamber in the middle. You can see up here uh, the pay martin and some of its kits nesting. So, and then it can come out and it has two axes. So if any predator comes in, I don't know what type of predator would come in for it, but if it was, it has, it has an easy exit. And ours, me and my dad are putting up a pay marm box, I imagine. So, and then recently we'll put a North pay marm box up. That's your fellow John Toll. It's a bad image, but he's from the BBC and he's from a radio show. This fellow here is, is Paul, he's my mate. And we nearly killed him walking through. So the areas we put them in are hectic to get to. So it's really mucky and stuff like that. So he nearly had a heart attack coming to do it. And he done a wee piece of this. So he did uh, last week. A wee piece about putting the paymark boxes up and help promote the mountains wildlife. Here you can see it's a really bad image again, but you can see a pain martin kit. So one of the boxes I've had in two years, it's had kits twice. So it's they're doing well. So we're hoping the, the other boxes would get um do just as good as the first because it's just so safe for them up there, you know. And then after finding the pay martins and having the brain boxes up, I also wanted to survey them. So it was with the Belfast Hills. Uh we wanted to try to find the numbers of uh pay martins around the hills. So I stuck, stuck up a few feeders. These feeders, you fill them with peanuts. And anyone could do this. So if you if you think there's a wee area around your way what might have pain martins, get a squirrel feeder up. They love dates. So we sweet treats like dates, um, some jam, and uh, put, it, put it in and just have a camera at it and see what you can get. If you, you never know, you might get a pain martin close to where you live. And if you have an area where you might want to protect, pain martin's a good way of doing it. So food, we stuck up. A load of feeders, so I stuck them up in Lamb Jerg, uh, Carmony Hill, Black Mountain, Cave Hill, and it was a success. So, all my feeders were getting pay martins, so it showed that pay martins aren't as rare as people think. I think they're very understudied. Uh, I think they're mostly hanging out in land which is owned, they're not really hanging out in most nature reserves. Some nature reserves, yes, but a lot of nature reserves have too much access, so you're not going to get them. Uh, they like quiet places, there's a lot of quiet nature. There's actually a trend. Most uh, Ulster Wildlife Nature Reserves, which are more quiet, you get the pay martins. So, and it's the same. It's the same on the mountain. There's not that much paths. It's, it's less accessible. You're you're getting more wildlife, and it's a, it's a common trait everywhere. So this was actually recently we got three pay martins on the one feeder. So this is probably three of last year's kits, which is incredible. Um, this is this is Douglas. This is the male, big cheeky male. And then this is two or feeders, one's a lamb jerk. So it just shows they're all around the hills. And what we want to do is we want to use the Black Mountain as somewhat of a base to kind of spread them out throughout the hills. The mountain will only hold so much pay marns because they are very territorial. So we want to help use the mountain to spread them out across the hills because they're doing a good job. When it, um, even the gray squirrels, my mate now, uh, he said when he's younger, there used to be more gray squirrels. So the, it seems like since they've been there, there's been the trade of the grey squirrels going down. I've only ever seen one since I've been up the mountain, and that was actually last year. So I was raging about that because we want to try to get, we want to try to push for a reintroduction someday of reds. So we want to keep boosting these numbers up. So um, when you look at the, I kind of split the mountain into two places. So you've got the uplands, and then you've got the the lower the lower part of the slope. So the uplands to me, it's probably the most rich and diverse. Um, one of the best places I'd say in Ireland for kestrels. I've seen eight kestrels in the scat once and not and up up in the upper slopes of the mountain. Um the kestrels do so well because there's so much quarrying being done. Even though I was talking about a couple of slides back about the quarry. Um because quarries are quiet, they've actually provided good habitat for nests for, for birds like kestrels because they love cliff edges and quiet places to nest. Um great diving beetles is another good one. Um these are just all animals will stick out to me. There's probably animals what other people will see and they'll stick out demons. But when I go up, when I think of the mountain, these are the animals I think about. So the great diving beetle, it's one I love to watch. You watch it um, in the summer going and catching tadpoles and all. It's absolutely class. Smooth newts, um, protective species to do so well up the mountain. I've actually never seen an area with what, what has um, 
more than the mountain does. Um, the, 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 uh, the small white small white orchid, you get them. Uh, one's been found there not that long ago, which is really good. Um, they're an all rare plant. I think uh, the last one was found in Sleeve McCloud at some point, a couple of years, a good load of years back. You've got the uh, snipe. So when I'm walking through the mountain, usually on my hunts for the owls or whatever else I'm doing, especially as time of year or a few months back anyway, is that we miss Josh and every couple of steps you're just getting snipes, getting flushed out left, right and center. And you know, these are all these are all species that aren't doing too well. So to have them all in an area, it just kind of shows that how, how much we need to look after it. So what I want to do is I want to find out all the species, get pictures of them and just show the average person. Look what we have up here. It's not just a, it's not just a, like a barn hill, it's it's full of life. The Merlin, Merlin's a beautiful bird, uh, one of their smallest birds of prey. Um, and you can, I've sat and watched them up in the mountain chasing uh, meadow pipits in the sky. One thing which really cool and fascinated about the Merlin, uh, it chases birds on the wing, which is brilliant to see. I was up with my mate Jack one time, what, and we just watched it chase a meadow pipit for ages. It was class. Um, the common lizard, common lizard does really good up in the mountain. There's a fence line that goes the whole way across the mountain and you can just walk across this fence and they love sitting out in the wood basking in the summer's day. And you can just, I've counted probably over a hundred just walking across a fence, which is probably half a mile long. It's also um, one of the best places for wax caps, parrot wax caps and stuff like that. So if you're in there on mushrooms, it's a good place to be. You've also got, you can't talk about the upper slopes without talking about skylarks. Skylarks to me, the sound of summer. So when you're up in this, when you're up in this mountain, you just hear them chirping all day long, and they're a, they're a beautiful bird, and they're one of the bird songs that uh, back in the day the mountain would have had more of. Uh, all these, the upper slopes of the mountain used to have breeding curlew, they used to have a uh, breeding lapwing, they used to have flocks of lapwing, and tons of tons of skylarks, and really that's not our anymore um, because we have made it accessible. It has drove the white life away, but. In that case, it was needed because if it wasn't accessible, then you probably would have lost at the quarry. Um, Narrow boarded um, bee hawk moth, which is really cool. Hawk, I love moths, and this moth looks like a bee. I think it's absolutely insane. Um, Devil's bit scabious is a good uh, plant. It's just a plant that reminds me of, of the upper slopes. Uh, it's a good feeder plant for uh, marsh artillery. Uh, Divis used to have lots of marsh artillery, but now it doesn't. But I've heard they might be trying to do a reintroduction soon, which would be really good. Um, wood tiger moth, an good moth, the Swiss, a beautiful bird, and again, just remind you of summer. These Swiss flag the whole way across from Africa. They can sleep with they can sleep with um half their brain. They can sleep on the wing, they feed on the wing, and they only really come down to breed. Meadow pipits. I look at meadow pipits as a feeder bird <laughs> for the bigger animals. So they're a beautiful bird, but they, they, they're so important to have up there because so much animals rely on them to eat. Um, weed ears, you get them up in the mountain and the snow bunting. Snow bunting is a really rare visitor, but Davis is really great for them, and so is the mountain. And these are the big dogs. So these are the absolute best of the best you could see up there. If you see any of these, you're, you're having a good day. So this is short eared oil. This is a picture when I was up, um, my mate Marty took. Um, and that was this is the best, one of the best white life encounters I've, I've ever had. So I was actually in the uh, barn up in Divis talking about how I was looking for owls and I always said I'm always up looking for owls I'm going to find an owl and I said to Rachel just before I left right I'm going to see an owl when I walk out here and, and no joke one just flew over my head or my dad it just flew over our heads and he got a picture of it the short-eared owl is a winter visitor uh, this bird comes to Divis and it's been notoriously always coming to Divis but no one's for a lot of years they haven't been coming back but I've noticed a trend with the short-eared owl and the hen higher that they're starting to come back and they're, and they're doing they're, they seem to be doing better um, cold weather pushes the short-eared owl over to um, Divis, so they'll be in Scotland, Scandinavia. And when it gets really cold here, they'll go, we'll move a wee bit, summer, we'll move a wee bit down south. And it usually brings them, say if you're in Scandinavia, it brings you to Scotland, or if you're in Scotland, it brings you to... So, and then you've got the hen higher, a rare raptor. You know, these birds aren't doing, these birds aren't doing well. And just for a wee hill up, or I seen four of them <laughs> as, as last year. You know what I mean? For a hill that supposedly doesn't have much weight life, we had four hen hires on it. So these hen hires will stop by on the way to the uh, Isle of Man, I think it is. So, and notoriously in the 70s, they would have had a winter roost. So I've been talking to people and they said they used to be about six or seven of them would have roosted um, down the ridges um, during the winter. 
And it seems that it's making a comeback. So with the hand hires, uh, we seen a male and three females this year. And for the last couple of years, I've only seen the one. So it seems like the numbers are going up, which is great to see. Another bird is the cuckoo. My mate Nal got this, sharpshooter. Um, I remember we were fitting on for the Chronicles of Belfast and when I, I went up and we're looking for foxes. So this is the first day they're fit, fit on me. And we went up to look for foxes and we had no luck looking for foxes. So I was sitting thinking, oh, geez, this is going terrible. No, I mean, like, what, what are we going to do here? And out of the blue, a cuckoo just started calling. First cuckoo I've ever heard. And over the course of the next few months, we've seen about six of them. Uh, the cuckoos are a really interesting bird. Um, they actually resemble sparrowhawks. They play a form of baits in mimicry. So... If you ever seen a cuckoo, they're very similar to a sparrowhawk. And the reason why is because when a wee meadow pipit is in its nest, the cuckoo will come over, hover over the nest. The meadow pipit will see the cuckoo and go, it will shade itself and then it will fly out thinking that the, the, the cuckoo's a sparrowhawk. Cuckoo comes down, lays its egg, meadow pipit's none the wiser and raises its chick. So, and then you've got the lower slopes of the mountain. Um, again, just wee animals will stick out to me. Uh, that was Coach Horse Beetle. Why would you not like that? Look at that thing. Crazy. Predatory beetle. Bluebells. Um, our bluebells bloom a wee bit later, so they do. So in the mountain, the bluebells will go really late compared to the lower, lower parts of Belfast. And usually around the hatchet field and all across, the whole mountain turns purple with bluebells because when you're looking across, that was all once woodland. Um, the flowers you get along the upper slopes um, are just usually bluebells and wood anemones. And that all is indications that there was once woodlands there. Um, the sparrowhawk, beautiful bird, um, nesting right now. When I'm up, you can hear them calling. Um, I think they're a really underappreciated bird, and you don't really get to see much of them because they're so fast. And when you do see them, they're sometimes I've been in the trees just hooking about, and one flies right past your head, and a skirt of life out of you. Foxes, I think it's crazy that we have canines still running about Ireland. Don't think much people appreciate that. Um, and it's one of the best things ever when you're up there and you see a big fox just going past. A Norbert, Woodcocks, um, to me, absolutely fascinating. Um, this time, it, usually in the winter time, you look up in the air and they'll be flying about like bats and they're huge and they'll be making their wee noises and they sound like, I don't even know what they sound like, they sound like an alien. They're, they're absolutely crazy. And these wee birds are uh, nocturnal and they would probe about um, looking for food. One of the things about the woodcock is when you see one, they'll probably give you a heart attack because they will you will you will not see it until it sees you. And by the time you see it, it will be flushed up, banging its head off every branch, trying to get away from you. Um an orby bird will warblers, there it won't be long until they're here. Um, usually when you're in the forest and you have a wee hammock up, you're chilling out, listen to the will warblers. Beautiful wee bird what comes to away from Africa, which is I think the same again, and they'll breed on our mountain. Um, the butterfly orchid. Beautiful plant. Uh, you get this on the lower fields, and hopefully, in the meantime, uh, we can start managing these um, fields better to bring more of them in. And you can't really talk about the mountain without talking about the buzzard. Beautiful birds, extinct in Ireland a hundred years ago, and now they're one of our most common birds of prey. Um, sometimes you can go up that mountain and you can see nine or ten of them in the sky at once, all getting ready, purring up, sky dancing. Um, this is kind of a wee bit. Some animals I haven't seen much, but I've seen them. And the reason they're not doing well is because they're under threat. So the paragon, um, our hills should have loads of paragons. They, sh they, sh they should be full of them, but they're not. Um, I only know of one pair, what bees on the mountain. Um, so these paragons love to uh, nest in the cliff edges, quarries. But over years, they've been absolutely destroyed by pigeon men. So I know a lot of pigeon men myself. And what they do is they tie wee pigeons to bricks and they'll put cyanide in it or they'll poison, they'll poison the pigeon. So the wee pigeon will be tied to a brick and then the paragon will come down and take it and it will kill the paragon. And they're a bird, which they've never got it easy, but hopefully with a wee bit of education, we can start to try to bring them back on the mountain. I've seen one this year. It looks like it was built in a nest. Fingers crossed it gets a mate. Um, primrose, this time of the year, you've got primrose all about the place. And I'm actually put this shrew in because I've seen the shrew just yesterday. So it was actually class. Um, I was hooking about and I was t I, I was moving about to put my camera up and then one just ran out of the leaves and it was my first time seeing one up in the mountain. I knew I had them, but I've never seen one. Um, shrews are, pygmy shrews are crazy wee animals. They're the fastest heartbeat of any mammal 
and they can they have to eat a hundred that 125 percent times their body weight a day to survive crazy um the house martins see my first house martin today in the bog meadows so these birds uh come the whole way from africa as well and they'll, they'll be in big numbers on the mountain um now has a wee shed out his back my, my mate and they would literally just nest in his shed and want to see his back garden just on the the face of the mountain and they'll just be falling here you've got a jaybird um the the, the scream the screaming birds beautiful birds and they seem to be doing well when i was a kid i didn't see much jaybirds so they seem to be making a wee comeback um this animal here it's a stoat to me stoats are rare and pain martins um i've only ever seen one stoat on the mountain that's dead it's been dead it's been knocked over um I feel like they're not doing too well and they're one of them animals that probably need a wee bit more support because they like them um they like um verges of hedgerows and open grass and old school style farming what we really don't have anymore, you know. And we need to this is what we want to do with the mountain. We want to make sure we keep that intact that because the mountain's all very old school in the way it's managed and we'll need to keep that going. Um if you're a birder, you know this bird, it's a hobby. This bird is absolutely insane. It I've seen it twice now in the summertime. And it, you could actually see it up in Divis going after dragonflies. It, that's a wee tiny bird. I think it's the smallest bird of prey would get coming over here. And that would be going after dragonflies and other wee birds. And then you've got your badgers. Uh, the mountain's doing really good with badgers. We, we try not to post badgers too much on our sites because we know what people are like sometimes. We try, so the reason all these animals, we talk about them, but there's some animals you can't show. You, you wouldn't show a peregrine falcon. You wouldn't show a badger and you wouldn't show a her because that would just bring people up. So... It's sad, but sometimes you can't show you can't show the full extent of the mountains where it live. And then you've got the big dogs of the lower slopes. So this wee picture here is the long eared owl. Uh, we have, I think it's about five pairs nesting on the mountain. Um, beautiful birds. Um, their chicks look really grumpy. I think he is a star. So we were actually videoing for the Chronicles of Belfast when Ronald got that on, uh, got that on camera. Beautiful bird. We we're after him for a while. I think what a real big turning point when it came to the mountain was showing that we had owls. I think that blows people's minds. There's owls in Ireland. That's crazy. So the barn owl, um, I've seen that. I've seen it three times. I can't get a picture of it, but I don't know if it's nesting on the mountain, but it's definitely passing by and it's definitely using the mountain to hunt. Um, between these two owls, uh, the long-eared owl, you know, is a lot more abundant. Um, they're able to hunt them woodlands, while barn owls, again, like the stoats, they need them open, they need them verges and hedgerows, and they need um old old school style farming, which we don't really have anymore. But if you look at the mountain, the mountain's perfect for it. The mountain is perfect for a barn owl. What we're missing is old trees. I feel like maybe in a year's time, I could imagine a barn owl flying through, um, flying through the mountain about 50, 60 times a year, probably way more than that. And if we had some boxes up or um older trees, we'd definitely have barn owls. I bat my life on it. And then you've got the pain martin, the animal that really started it all. So for all these animals, I know it's a lot to put in your head. That's not even a fraction of the way life varies. These are just animals that stand out to me. And for an area to have free species of owl and not be under some sort of special protection is absolutely insane. You know, it's an area that's holding three three different types of owl. Where do you hear about that? I've never heard of it. So especially in Ireland. So now so as we got all the wildlife, our plan was to the plan was to help the mountains wildlife through education and restoration. So after we find all the animals, I talked to a few landowners, Martina and I talked to Nal. And me and Nal were having a chat one day and we're saying, what should we do? And then we decided to put a label, a label on what we're doing here. Instead of just being just, you know what I mean, doing as you will, we're gonna we're gonna put a name on it and we're gonna really try to shoot for the stars here. So we decided that the Nal was gonna plant his his land. Which is very nice of him. Like he's planted so far. I might be wrong here, but I think it's 2,000, 2,200 odds up the top, and then a few hundred along the bottom. Um, and after we got planting here, and then that's when everyone started paying attention to it. Look what they're doing. This is the first bit of real conservation work being done on the mountain, you see. And then education through educational talks. I'll talk more about the planting soon, but um, education is you can't do conservation without education. Education is the most important thing in the world. People are so out of touch with nature now it is. Um, you know what I mean? You bring kids up, they're scared to get dirty. They're scared to eat a berry. You know, it's like it, we're driven so much away from our roots as a species. <laughs> so 
what I like doing is I like getting kids up the mountain. I like getting them up here. I like showing them it's okay to think, but I also love showing them that there's wildlife on the mountain. Because when we were brought up in the mountain when we were younger, we were sure to use it as like a tool for your head or like a recreational type of thing. But now I want to show people that it's not, it may, it is good for recreation, but this is, this is just for wildlife. This needs to be like, this is their home. And we need to do the best we can to show the people what's on this mountain so we can look after it better. You know what I mean? People are less inclined to burn it and litter on it if they, if they know that there's, there's animals up there, you know? Like even now, like used to find rubbish and people up drinking and stuff like that. I'd have a wee drink up, a drink up by myself, but I'd always bring my rubbish down. And you'd have people going up having a drink and they would, now you're seeing it being all left in the bag. You know what I mean? They're not, they're not throwing the rubbish everywhere or they're bringing the rubbish back down. So I've done a few ones. This one here is with, um, uh, this is a cross community group, um, tire stock. And we brought these up. We've done about tree planting. Uh, we learned them about the species of bats on the mountain and we'll put up bat boxes. Uh, we've had people down from like Omeath and stuff or Oma um, to up the plant trees. We've had school groups up, multiple school groups, youth clubs. Um, and we've been doing nature walks and showing them the way life on the mountain. And we've been bringing them out for litter picks, tree planting and all this type of stuff is, if you see, we're going full circle here. So we're bringing it back to the roots. So what we're doing is we're trying to, you can see the resemblance here. So we're, we're now going back to the roots of what we need to do to protect this mountain is we can keep it for the wildlife all you want, but we need to learn people of its importance. So this is the plans for the nature recovery network. So now this is my, this is my drawing. I'm no expert. You know I mean, I can't even put videos in the PowerPoint. Uh, so more or less, there's a tree line that goes all across this mountain. And what we want to do is we want to thicken it up and make it better. So we started off, now started off in his land up here. And he planted a load of trees and we've got it down there. And the species mix is beautiful. Now, now it's good. He's, he's picking all these trees, but you would never hear of being planted anywhere. Burn pens and stuff like that. So it's going it's to be beautiful when it, when it grows. And I think he sees his back like an artistic vision. He just pictures it when it's all grew, what, what it's going to look like. And he's he, fair play to him for it because it's, it's going to be amazing. And then we've got uh, the Bell's land here, which we've got planting. There's a lot of um, bracken and stuff like that, which is taking over really bad. For us as a project, to tackle this bracken would be more or less impossible. So our idea is to kind of plant it up. And then here in the beautiful grasslands, we need to make a buffer zone with fencing. So we'll use fencing as a buffer zone for cattle. And if we can have the mountain, uh, uh, we'll give it a help by planting it, but if we can have it, restoring itself as well through tree planting then we can have this all being grazed and it would have a lovely grass in the top with your big cracking forest your big native forest and if we were just to fence it off and leave it to plant by itself you'll probably get a bunch of sycamores popping up um a bunch of the same species so when it comes to rewailing sometimes it is it's important to give a hand you know because we haven't got the species here to kind of manage it all so we have to we have to intervene and be and be to manage we have to manage the land so if say for talk's sake if i just fence this all off you'll probably get the whole tree all the trees being sycamore you know so by doing some strategic planting and putting different species in we're able to increase the variety of species in the area so this is one of the big plants in the future nice is only one half of the moon it's a massive piece of land but we want to try to get this going and when the efs scheme comes to go we can get all the landowners all the landowners on board and with the other side of the mountain do that and it will be one, well, I'd say it'll be one of the biggest plants in the history of Belfast or probably the history of the North. It, it's a massive piece of land to be planting. Um, so this is the first year of tree planting. Uh, we had the kids from uh, Corpus Christi Youth Club up planting. So this is we had a strategic planting. There's a bit of um, ash rootland around the mountain, which is down. And we're sticking in trees in between uh, oaks and stuff like that. Trees were on really on the mountain. And we're trying to sub, because we're trying to plant up the mountain. So when these ice do die, not only we're going to die, but we we'll want to have some sort of um, we want to have at least some sort of variety or understory under story coming up for when they do fall down. Um, this is all from the same planting. So this is when we're planting in between the trees. This is me up with contractors who are planting Niles land. Um, these boys, you think you can plant the tree? You want to see these boys? Um, planted about two thousand trees in about an hour or something like that. They're absolute animals. And then we've got planting happening out in Niles back. Here's Niles here in the red jacket. Loving it. Not all the trees on my back. Happy days. <laughs> so uh, the thing about Niles back is he has uh, 
uh, he has donkeys. So you have these these cactus guards that are pretty expensive. So with the help of the Belfast Hills and other other people, he is able to get uh, funding sorted for to get these cactus guards on his trees. And there's the mascot of the Rewilding Project there, Ali, a beautiful dog. So the, even the plant seventy trees out his back using these cactus guards takes forever. So it's a it's, it's a lot of work and. It's just something you have to do, you know what I mean? You're not going to get rid of the donkeys because the donkeys are class. So you need to, you need to do this type of thing to have the, the forest get up and going and give it a kickstart. Um, this is the second year of planting. This is when everything started to really go up in numbers. We've seen our project just growing and growing. Um, one thing about our project is we love to get everyone involved. You know what I mean? You can't just have, you can't just have one side doing something. You have to have every, everyone doing it because at the end of the day, it's our mountain. It's for everyone. Um, so... Now, usually on a tree plant, we're getting the 20 to 40 volunteers, which is, it's, just, it's brilliant. You know, it's just good to see some of your, your revision just coming to life and it's just, it's just sprouting up and they may not know it, but every one of you helps. One day you're going to look up at this mountain and it's going to be absolutely insane. The difference you make in the way life you're going to see and the difference of the way life is, it's going to be amazing. And, and we couldn't have done it without all the volunteers. So this is one day we're planting for um, the Chronicles of Belfast. This is seven foot tall oaks, big whips. Uh, planted them. These people came. I think, I think it's only for it could be wrong. It may be forever now, but they came the whole way up just to just to give us trees. I think it was a four hour drive, so it's probably longer in Omeath. And it just shows like there's people from down south and all coming up. They, they, you know what I mean? It's it's really it's really class to see. And then our second uh planting at Nile's back with Arch Sacta, which is good. And I got on board with Arch Sacta, and they actually um funded the cactus guards and all for him for his back. And they planted a big range of species there. So that will all be coming up soon, hopefully. Um, again, with the cross community groups, having them up planting, kids up planting trees. And they hate it at the start, but they love it once they're up. Well, one thing I love about getting kids up a mountain is you'll see that when they're sitting all in a group before they go up, they'll all be on their phones and they'll be quiet. And then once they're up in the mountain, not, not one of them will be on their phone. They'll all be talking and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be enjoying their time. And they don't, they don't even realize it. And um, here's one of the planting we had here. We had about 40 people up that day. We planted 700 trees, I think. Um, that was a great day. And that was just when it kind of sprung the mind that here, we're, we have something special going on here. You know, it's, it's, there's so much people helping out and it's just great to see. And there's my girl planting the tree. I recently got engaged to her. Um, I made her work for it. I made her work for that ring. Like, so she had to plant about 4,000 trees before I stuck a ring on her finger. And here is the pond. So, I showed you all the notes when you get up in the upper slopes and uh, the great Devon beetles and stuff, but you do not get them down the lower parts of the mountain. So what I was thinking was, let's make a pond. Let's just do it. And we couldn't get a digger in, so we had to do it um, all by our hands with shovels. And it was such crack. Um, we got a big squad up and we actually got it done pretty fast, to be honest. Um, one thing was when we had a dog, we're like, right, we've got a dog now. What are we go, how, how are we going to buy this pond liner? Liner is going to be a, the pond liner was going to cost a couple of grand. And luckily enough, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Sean swung his pickaxe down, hit a spring, and now it's just a self feeding pond. And we we're absolutely over the moon about this. But then I thought, oh Jesus, we had a spring. How are we going now? We have to put an overflow in it, and we're going to have to put some sort of drainage. So that was a whole new problem. And but. We got it sorted. Uh, the pond itself was meant to be tiny, but that kind of chanced my arm and made it like a lake. <laughs> and already it's coming alive. So is it the finish? It touches the pond. My dad's a joiner, so he helped me with the overflow. Um, what we've done was we just put a few blocks down to let the, the water sleep, sleep, uh, seep in slowly. Because there is drainage, we don't want the top, the top layer of water just getting sucked down really fast because midges and everything else and what are we bugs and insects they'll lay their eggs in the top of your water and it'll just get sucked down the drain so we wanted to slow the flow down and by using these blocks we we're able to slow the flow down of water and now like it's still top um everything around the pond if you throw a stick in the pond it will stay still it won't get sucked down the middle and that's important because last thing you want is frogs being or top holes being in here and just getting sucked down into the mountain there's my dad after doing it looking like he just came back from columbia um, absolutely stinking, but it all worked out well. This is the pond now, and it's you can picture it, and it's starting to have a bit of regrowth on it. We see that the banks of wayflowers and stuff like that, we all chipped in, and uh, yeah, everything we're doing here, we're not we're not a constituted group, we're not a funded group. Everything we're doing, we rely on like the Belfast Hills or us chipping in with our own money. You know, we're not. This is just all what we all do in our free time. There's no, 
there's no funding for us. You know, it's just, it, we're, we're not all millionaires, but we we'll, we'll do the we'll do best what we can do. Um, so now, so far, we've got uh, four batches of frog spawn in the pond, which have already hatched. I've never heard of um, having a pond on this and frog spawn going in on that day, on that year. That's pretty crazy. So it just shows that the lower slopes needed needed a pond. We've already had dragonflies in. The days we're digging, we had dragonflies trying to lay eggs in the wee bits of water. Um, so I'm expecting lots of dragonflies this year. And we've had a heron at the pond. Again, really bad photo, but you can see them there. So that's the first heron I've ever seen in the mountain. Um, which is absolutely class. Um, so we've got the pond, and this is really what's next for the mountain is the real rewilding starts. Uh, my my idea and my vision for the mountain is we want to try get fix all the fencing, all the fencing's um, destroyed, and because of that, um, farm animals are grazing the mountain all year round. So it's all sludgy, it's mucked everywhere, and it's just going to keep degrading if it keeps it up, and if it does keep it up. If it keeps going the way it's going, the mountain there's no you can plant all the trees you want. The mountain's going to go in better, better form for it or worse form. So we we'll want to try to get uh, some funding going on, maybe with the nature recovery network, and start to actually fence off areas we just want to plant. And that means you just stick a few trees in, and then you, it can plant itself. Um, we we'll want to get our group constituted, so we we'll want to get a group so we can actually apply for funding. Um, you know what I mean? Because if we're doing this with our free time and all our money, picture what we could do with with some money behind us. You know what I mean? With actual money behind us, not just like our, what our, our spur change. Um, we we'll want to have a habitat prep for kites. Uh, red kites are making a comeback, and they've been getting spotted near Belfast uh, breeding and stuff. So, well, in Belfast breeding, so it won't be long until I'd say in our two years time we'll have red kites on the mountain, and that's a positive. Uh, but you can see here like the, with what the fencing does, you know. And if you're if you've heard about rewriting, it's like the, it's the way to go. You know what I mean? If you have all the fans and sorted, it will start to plant up itself. We can just do some, we can just put different species in and let it reclaim itself naturally. I want to have red squirrels on the mountain someday. That's probably it's one of the ones people will be like, you're never going to have them because the council don't do this and the council don't do that with, with their land and calling grey squirrels. But believe you me, I'm going to have red squirrels on that mountain and I'm going to have golden eagles up there someday before I croak it. And that's, I, I'm going to make sure of that. And so this is North to finish it off with some questions. And this is a picture we got during uh, about a month ago of the Aurora above Divis. So that's me finished. And if any of you got any questions, let me know, please. That's great. Um, I mean, there's been some fantastic comments coming into the chat. So I'm just taking a look through here. Yeah, um, there's a few requests for people are asking about trail camera recommendations. Um, if you yes. have anything that's maybe particularly good at catching fast species like Pine Martin. So with trail cameras, you're better off getting the cheap ones. Um, I think so anyway, in case they get stolen. I my trail cameras always cost about 35 quid. It, you don't need you don't need high quality. Um, and the, these we brand I buy is actually it, the images are decent. It's called Vixture. And if you type them in on Amazon, fix your trail camera, they should come up and there, there, there'll be a model for about 35 quid. And they're the best ones to get, I think, because last thing you want to do is I spent 250 quid on one before. And it didn't even do half of the stuff the other one done. It kept freezing and then, and then it broke. And all the dear ones I bought broke. It seems like the cheaper ones do, do better. No point spending all your money on them. But yeah, fix is the way to go. And there was someone was asking as well if there's like any advice for um sighting pine martin boxes or tape trail cameras where they won't be interfered with or stolen. Yeah, so uh the best place to probably put them is if you hate a site gets walked through, um there's no there's no point putting the box up because once someone goes near the box, that's gonna be that's gonna be it. Um they're gonna be scared off. Um what I do in an area to look for pine martins is I would just look about and look if you can't find your scat, look for prints. And if you can't find your prints, get some uh, jam, dates, some tuna, throw it on the ground and put your trail camera beside it in an area. And these, these smells will attract the pain martin. And if there's a pain martin in your area, if you put these foods down, it will smell them and it will come to them. The best way to do it is not to try to get them to come to the feeders at the start. Work out if they're in an area by putting food on the floor and not too much, not too much food. But if you put a wee bit of bait down on the floor, you'll get them faster. And once you know they're in the area, then you move on with a feeder. And once you have them feeding in an area, they'll come to that feeder every night. And then you can have a box up close to the feeder. And that's, that's, the, that's the way to go about it. But yeah, if there's any areas you think they are, just go and check because you never know the difference you can make. Because these pain martins have got, I mean, look, look what's happened, you know? So anything else? 
That's great. And um, just to say, uh, Nina has shared in the comments as well, we linked a video about um, trail cameras on the Ulster Wildlife YouTube. So if anyone's interested, that's another wee resource for you. Yeah. There's a, um, are you able to put the link in for the Treasure of the Hills video on YouTube? There's you. Oh, yeah. Um, so if any, it shows you all the wildlife on it. Well, Dave, I'll stick that in because we're going to be sending around the recording of this talk. So we can mm -hmm. stick that video in with the recording as well so that everyone can, can follow it up and watch it, um, if, if that sounds good. Yeah. So we'll email that round to everyone after, after the talk as well because, um, yeah, it's a great video. Um, this question from Henrietta here about has there ever been any conflict with suburban residents over like the spread of pine martens? And she's thinking of cage and aviary pets in the gardens. Yeah, so that's the thing. Like, um, people make the, the well, if, if there's a way to get in your chickens, it's going to get in. But do you know, at the end of the day, it's um, a chicken's a domesticated animal, a pine martens whale, so it has more place here, in my opinion. So so just um you, you need you need to you need to have secured better um I think with any animal if it's domesticated a wild animal will have will have more right to be here and as bad as it sounds it's true because our wildlife is doing terrible so you know what I mean if if you're going to um persecute pay martins or people may try to persecute them they're just doing what a pay martin does and the pay martin's hungry the pay martin's living in the wild it's not getting fed at the same time every day as pay martin's eating to survive but we everyone seems to love them around here it's like all the schools and all the kids, they all love them. So, uh, the hen, and then I think I've seen something about hen harriers breeding. They used to breed on the, the mountain, and um, they're just hunting. Um, but we want to try to have the we're trying to actually work with um, the Divis now to close a couple of paths so to have a, an area where there isn't dog walkers going through and there isn't people going through so that they can maybe breed. So, I'm go grab a charger. Mm -hmm. But yeah, with the hen hires, it's all about limiting access. Because when you limit access, and then you have, you haven't got as much stuff disturbing them, so they can, uh, maybe breed. You know, what I mean, you used to have curly breeding and everything up that mountain. You don't get it anymore. Anything else? Uh, it's a question about what your go-to trees are to plant on the mountain. Um, the mountain doesn't have any oak, so oak, uh, sasso oak, um. Uh, silver birch, um, hazel, holly, uh, alder, um, du, 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 uh, rowan, um, hawthorn, and then now was planting some trees. He is putting goat willow and everything in. So we, there's a couple of witch elm trees on the mountain and stuff. So just anything, anything really native and anything what produces a lot of food for the wildlife, you know. But uh, we haven't really been planting any ice. We've been planting. Mostly, uh, predominantly, with that, the tree we've been planting is oak because, you know, we want to have what well, it's the tree that's completely avoid from the mountain, and holly as well. And all we all we trees would do good over the winter and produce berries. You know, some of the that's another thing. If you've uh, areas where there's lots of hawthorn are good areas to look for pay martens. Pay martens love hawthorn berries in the winter, so if you're looking in the winter for pay martens, an area with hawthorn is really good. Um, someone's asked about the status of the mountain in terms of ownership and management as well. And they're wondering if you've done grazing regimes in the upland section and whether you have to convince landowners to get on board. What was it? Sorry, what was the first part? Sorry, so the first part was about the status of the mountain in terms mm -hmm. of ownership. Yeah, so the mountain um it has a lot of different owners. Um luckily all the owners love wildlife. Um some are a wee bit more easier to work with than ours, but that's just part of the challenge. What you need to do is with what I want to do is, I, I don't think people should plant their land without getting a few quid for it. You know, they're giving up, they're giving up land, it's probably worth a fortune to them. And I know it's money, you know, I mean, cash is king at the end of the day. And, you know what I mean? People aren't going to sell their land for nothing. So we're, what we want to do is we want to wait until the EFS scheme comes out and we want to get all these landowners on board just the way it is in over in Loch Ness and do something like that over here and get them all paid for it. Because if you give up your land for nature, you, you're, you're a legend. I think you deserve a few quid for it. So, that's what we want to try to do. We want to try to get people paid for making their land better on the moon. And we want to get all the landowners working together. And what we'll do as a project is we will make them and meet the standards. We'll help them and meet the standards of the EFS scheme. So we will work and we will help them with fencing. We'll help them move cattle. And But at the moment, it's just so much, it's so separate. And we need to work in a way to try to get everybody on the same page. There's one side of the mountain where everyone's on the same page and the other side, we're still working on it. So we'll want, if we can get both sides of the mountain working together, we're flying. 
and we can only really do that through money. You know, I mean, money talks. Um, and then the other wee bit of that question was just about whether you've implemented a grazing regime in the upland section. Uh, what are we, are we going to implement one? Yeah, like I have you or you yeah. planning to? Yeah. So the National Trust already have um, cows what are um, what do graze the land, but they're getting their fair gap in the fence. Um, there's another uh, farmer farmer called Fraser the Grazer. Um, we have he has sheep uh, or his cows uh, graze the land, but what we want to do is we want to kind of have work in conjunction with the National Trust. We want to create a buffer zone between the separates the woodland on the slopes for the grassland and that buffer zone will go right across the mountain with fencing. And then we can work with National Trust to let their, to have all their cattle down and grazing the land and grazing it better. Cause it's getting grazed, but it's not, it's getting, it's, getting, it's only about six or seven cows on it. And then we need more than that. And then the lower parts of the mountain, them lower fields, we want to try to get um, them fenced off too and get gates on so we can regulate grazing on the fields because we're getting grazing all year round and it's just destroying the place. Now there is some cracking wild flower meadows on it, but we we'll want it, you can make it better if you can select it, if you can selectively choose your grazing. But yeah, there's a few, few cows grazing the top, but we need more because if you go to Divis, it's grazed perfectly. And then when you come into the Black Mountain, it's, it's, it's poor quality. Loads of bracken and stuff sprouting up because it hasn't been getting grazed as much. Um, and then Andy Kenny has also asked, about your favorite forageable food? Uh, I love the the alpine strawberries you get. They're my favorite. Um, the mountain has loads of them, blueberries and stuff like that as well. Yeah, I'd, it's just bar the berries. I love them. So I'd actually go and grab a load of strawberries and make smoothies now with them. But you need to grab a couple hundred of them. They'll be tiny things like. <laughs> but they're worth it. They're, the pack of pumps are tasty. Great. Um, I think that's all the questions I can see in the chat, unless anyone else has any. Great, I, I think that might be us awesome. then. Um, great, well, thanks so much, Aaron. That was such a great talk. And um, thanks to everyone for coming along. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Um, just to let you know, um, oh, one question there. Um, how can everyone find out about helping out with your project, Aaron? Um, yes, so Facebook, it's called the Black Mountain Rewilding Project on Facebook and on Instagram. It's the same name, Black Mountain Rewilding Project. Um, if you can't get that, just follow me on Facebook or Instagram, Aaron Kelly. And my picture is me holding a big oil or the or the, the mountain project is just the it's our it's our logo. So yeah, we we regularly post on that when, when there is stuff coming up. And listen, the more the merrier. We want everyone up here doing a part because the more when it comes to conservation, you want to have everyone on board. You can't have a selective group. And what we want to do is we want to we want everyone to be involved in this. So kids look at it and be like, here, it's normal. You know what I mean? It's normal to go up and plant a tree or it's normal to do this. One thing we do, we get boxing clubs and all and a lot of people doing the ponds or MMA fighters because where I live, people respect fighters. And seeing like MMA fighters or boxers planting trees makes it look a wee bit more normal to be doing, you know? We need to kind of, what we want to try to do is normalize looking after the planet. You know, it's because people look at it like you're a weirdo. They do, and you have, you have, you have to make it normal. But yeah, it's free Instagram or Facebook and we'll, we'll be posting all our stuff on that. Great, fantastic. Um, and, and just to let you guys know, there's we're coming up to the end of our members talk series, but we do have Ronald Zerger's talk on wildlife photography, which has been rescheduled for next Wednesday night. Um, so make sure to register if you want to watch that or if you want to get the recording afterwards. Um, and then that's the end of our talk series, but we do have quite a few uh, members events coming up um, over the next couple of months. We've got a red kite tour, um, a coastal wildlife walk, a foraging walk, a bee and butterfly walk. So check out our website for everything that's coming up. Um, and I know that a good number of people here tonight are members of Ulster Wildlife. So I just want to say a huge thank you again for your support because you really do. Um, it makes such a huge difference and it's so appreciated. Um, and yeah, thank you to everyone for coming along tonight. And yeah, hope you enjoyed it. And um, thanks very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Last <laughs> time.